Stop to hang out. We really appreciate it. It's a great turnout. Uh, well, thanks for stopping by. Uh, we're, I'm going to be teaching a series for the next two weeks after tonight on well, or arguments for God. So, like, there's different ways of approaching and talking to people. Um, if any of you have ever read Jay Warner Wallace's book, um, The Cause of Cause, I believe the name of it, it's um, basically walks you through several different arguments for God and instead of just focusing on one say we know god is real because of this he focuses on saying well there's several different ways that we that all once you add them up to get it together build a picture to show that god is real uh, now we can never know with 100 percent certainty that god is real but we also can't know really anything outside of that we exist is 100 percent true if you think about it everything else to a certain extent you don't know with 100% certainty that it exists. For all we know, we could be in the matrix, but uh, really, other than you, you know that yourself uh, exists, that's the only thing that's 100% true. Uh, but we can have high level of confidence. Like, I can have a high level of confidence that gravity is going to be in effect tomorrow. I can have a high level of confidence that the sun's going to rise tomorrow. So we can have a high level of confidence that God does exist. And what I'm going to focus on is the angle of not necessarily using the Bible, but you know, showing how other arguments excuse me, support the idea that God exists. So we're going to look at that tonight. We're going to look at some moral argument tonight. We're going to look at the cosmological uh, argument on next Thursday, and then the scientific or teleological argument on the Thursday after that. So you all are all welcome to come back for those. Just to give you an idea of... Uh, what I did to prepare for this series. Whoa! So, I like reading, in case you didn't know. <laughs> so we've got about six different books here that I've used to put together all this material. Um, those are the ones I've used. Uh, I'll try and pick out the ones that I've used for this slide. Um, we, a lot of them were from Frank Turek, honestly. He did two books. One, Stealing from God. It's a great book. Uh, Interesting read on that one. Talks about the moral argument again, and then I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Uh, so this one, it goes, it's pretty thorough, and then it goes through several different arguments and has a moral argument in it, but this one really focuses in on that. So uh, you're welcome to borrow these if you ever want. Uh, I really enjoyed reading them. They are a little heavy, but I think if you're, if you're searching for answers in that, it's a big help for sure. So, uh, any questions on that so far? All right. Feel free to raise your hand if you have a question going through the slides. Uh, I'll do my best to answer them. And we will have Q&A after the lesson if any of you have more questions. Uh, I will say if we're going to talk about it later on the slide, I may just say we we're going to talk about that later and we'll come back to your question if it doesn't get answered. Feel free to ask me again on that one. So, here we go. All right, so here's the basic premise behind the moral argument. Objective morality can't exist without a creator. And we're saying objective morality does exist, so there has to be a creator. All right, that's it. We can all go home now. <laughs> well, guys, thanks for coming out. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, really, that's the basic premise. I know it seems really simple, but we'll walk through and tease this out what that really means. All right, so... Even founded in the United States is the assumption that there is a creator. Uh, if you look at the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, it mentions creator in there, and it talks about people having unalienable rights. Well, some people would argue, well, isn't that just the government signing you those rights? But unalienable means they're inseparable from you. Now, yes, they can be denied to you, but that goes against the moral fabric, you could say, and that's why the United States was declaring their independence because they felt like their rights were being abused. So they're saying outside of government, there are inalienable rights that belong to you and you can't get to that unless you have a creator to begin with. So just to show a little bit of how American history uh, assumes a creator. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so now talking about rationalizing morality. There's different ways that uh, non-Christians will theorize on how to get to objective morality. Uh, the moral argument is discussing that idea here. Uh, again, if there's no creator or designer, all morality becomes subjective at this point. In 
means that it's not outside of either a certain group of people or even you per se. It's just sub it's subjective and can change depending on who you ask. Again, the United States uh, has founded assuming that there is a creator of some sort. Uh, and while I, I would argue that there's a lot of people in the U.S. they don't necessarily think this through about objective morality and that they believe it exists and they, I would say even non-Christians, like they live perfectly moral lives, as you could say, but they don't necessarily think about why they live moral lives and where that morality comes from. And so I'm hoping that we can start conversations at least with people, just get people thinking about this. So I'll share some stories I've had with coworkers in the past and just give you some ideas on that one. Um, but really, if you think about this, but we, if we came from a purely naturalistic philosophy saying that there was no intelligent design at all, no creator to begin with, and that everything was an accident, then there is no, there's no reason morality should exist. There is nothing from science that would say morality would become, would uh, be, start being for any particular reason. It would just be purely made up by whoever is observing morality at that point. So there's nothing objective about it, nothing for me to say that's evil, that's wrong, because it would just be my opinion. I love it. <laughs> so I'll start off with a story here. Um, I once had a coworker, he had a Middle Eastern background, and he had uh, lived in the Middle East for a while. He had actually grown up there for a few years. And at one point in his life, he had been walking down the street and a bomb went off. And it just blew him across the street. He ended up having back problems from it for the rest of his life. Well, so he still does, I should say. Um, it was just a horrible scene he had to witness over there. And so he eventually came back to the US and we ended up working together several years back. And so I had gotten to know him, built a relationship with him over the years, and we met up at a restaurant at one point, and he had kind of disregarded his Islamic background and was just going on pure atheism at that point. So we started having a conversation about it, and he knew my background as a Christian, and I got to the point, knowing this story behind his beliefs and stuff, I asked him, is there such a thing as evil? And he had to think about that for a second, and he looked at me, Said, and this is him being an atheist. He said, "Yeah, there is evil. There has to be. And I said, if there's evil, then there has to be a God. And he really didn't have a great answer at that point. He, he kind of realized, didn't really want to admit it, but he realized, like, yeah, that, that's that's true, pretty much at that point. Um, so again, that's one way to kind of help people. I prefer to ask questions versus make statements, which. That's why I asked, you know, is there such a thing as evil? Most people, I would argue, God has put in into their nature the understanding of a moral law. Meaning, like, people know not to cheat on this, that cheating on your spouse is wrong. People know that murder is wrong. No one has to tell you that. You know that inherently. And people also recognize that there are some things that are evil. And they, while they understand that, it's very difficult outside of a... Um, a moral written down law to explain why something is evil. Because you have to have purpose before something can be evil. That's what we'll talk about more today. So let's uh, take the non-Christian approach and rationalize how we might come to morality. Most people agree that um, you know if someone's in a desperate spot, they should help them out, it should be nice to them, and that we should try and get along with everybody. That's not really a controversial thing. But if there's no creator, why should I sacrifice so that someone else could benefit? How does that benefit me? Why is that moral? So that's what we're going to think about or think through here. Uh, nature doesn't really compel anyone to act morally. If you think about it, like if you look at animals, like their, their morality doesn't really apply to them, right? If the lion kills a deer, that's not wrong. He's just trying to get his next meal. And so there's no morality inherent with animals, and so why would it be different for people? And that's kind of thought off somewhere. 
Now you can also say, well, let's try and be pragmatic and get along so that everyone can, uh, can benefit. And I, I understand where you're coming from on that, but there, there still there is no motivating factor for me to sacrifice so that other people can be better off. So here are the main ways that non-Christians, I would say, try to get to morality. We've got hedonism, which mainly is due to utilitarianism. We've got nihilism, relativism, and determinism. These are kind of big words, but we'll go through and explain what they all mean. All right, hedonism. Has anyone ever heard this word before? All right, there you go. You want to try to take a stab at explaining it? Um, Jordan Peterson defines hedonism very frequently as just the pursuit of pleasure. That's the greatest attainment, good, etc. Okay, appreciate that. So yeah, hedon, I got one right here. Uh, hedonism is a philosophy which argues that the aim of moral conduct is the attainment of the greatest possible pleasure with the greatest possible avoidance of pain. So the saying. Basically, do whatever you can, do, do, do what benefits you, and don't hurt other people, which sounds nice, but then you also got to think about, so why should I, again, why should I do something that would not benefit me, but benefit somebody else? Um, it really lacks that motivating factor for personal sacrifice, and while it, we all would agree that would be a good thing to do, but like, why would that be the case if it's a if it's a purely naturalistic world, we come from evolution, there's no creator, like, what's the point of sacrificing? Uh, Bertrand Russell had a great quote, I'm just going to read off here, it says that, we feel that the man who brings widespread happiness at the expense of misery to himself is a better man than the man who brings unhappiness to others and happiness to himself. I do not know of any rational ground for this view, or perhaps for the somewhat more rational view that whatever the majority desires is preferable to what the minority desires. These are truly ethical problems, but I do not know of any way in which they can be solved except by politics or war. Bertrand Russell, he was a um, big writer kind of in the early 20th century. Uh, he's passed away since then, but he was very well known back in the day. And really he's saying, other than going through politics and enforcing law or starting a war, hedonism is very difficult to rationalize as far as people actually following through on it. So being one more person, I guess. I just wanted to skip.